where the truth is usually stranger than fiction. The purpose of these shows are not to scare you, but to prepare you, because what you don't know could hurt you. The word says in Hosea 4.6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Thank you for joining us. My name is Julie, and here is the host of the show, Barry Meyer. Hey, we have a great show tonight. We have Derek and Sharon Gilbert. Now, I want to mention a few things. Um, now, we're a little mile south, or we're just north of Colorado, and in Well County, it's, what they're trying to do is become the 51st state. Now, things are going forward right now with that and the petitions with county commissioners and also the people out there. So be watching with that. Uh, now, also on July 1st, the, um, the 30 round clip ban down at the Capitol down there in Colorado goes into effect July 1st. Now, they're going to do a swap on the 2nd. So be watching what's going to happen there with the sheriffs and that. Uh, a lot of them are not supporting what's going on. And. You know, I am one that doesn't really care for musicals, but I have one that I really enjoy. It's called The Music Man. I'm bringing it up because I know Derek Gilbert is actually in a quartet. And Derek, um, that might be a forte you might like. Yes, that is... Uh, that Ice is one cream. Of these. Now you, sir. Ice cream. Now you, sir. Ice cream. Yeah, in fact, I like uh, ice cream. The, the uh, chorus that I sing with just did its annual show last, uh, well, this past weekend. And okay. they managed to work the ice cream gag into the show, even though the show was based on the theme of uh, uh, the old Andy Griffith show. Oh, really? So, yeah, that was the, the, there was a setup uh, being Barney was upset at three guys singing around the lamppost. And he takes him into jail and they managed to trick him into, you know, singing and uh, letting him out because he likes the harmonies. So um, it, it, it worked. It, yeah. it was uh, you know, mix, mixing and matching, but it, it worked, so. Well, my my yeah, favorite is a great show. My favorite part is the beginning where they're, they're working with the train. That was just so good how they did that. But he doesn't know the territory. Never heard of any salesman, Hill. Now he doesn't know the territory. Doesn't know the territory? What's a fella's line? Never worries about his line. Never worries about his line. Or a doggone thing. He's just a bang, beat, bell ringing, big hall, great go, neck or nothing, rip thrower, and every time a bullseye salesman. That's Professor Harold Hill, Harold Hill. What's a fella's line? What's his line? He's a fake, and he doesn't know the territory. Look, what do you talk? What do you talk? What do you talk? What do you talk? He's a music man. He's a what? He's a what? He's a music man, and he sells clarinets to the kids in the town with the big trombones and the rat a tat drums. Big brass bass, big brass bass. And the piccolo, the piccolo with uniforms, too, with a shiny gold braid on the coat and a big red stripe running. Well, I don't know much about bands, but I do know you can't make a living selling big trombones. No, sir. Mandolin picks, perhaps, and here it is. That's right. <laughs> it is brilliant. It's brilliant. Whoever thought of that really had quite a mind for that. And, you know, it's a great musical. Expect I, I like the 1956 one. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, the interesting thing, at least from those who are part of the Barbershop Harmony Society, as I've been for you know twenty four years, um, the the fellow who wrote the musical, Meredith Wilson, actually contacted a couple of guys from here in Central Illinois, in the Peoria area, for advice on who to get for the uh, the quartet. Oh. Uh, it's a fellow named Floyd Connett, who was actually a a barber in Peoria, and became the very first. Uh, kind of roving field man for the Barbershop Harmony Society. And Meredith Wilson got in touch with him and a fellow named Glenn Perdue from Peoria. Uh, Glenn, who I is, is still with us, uh, was actually the director of the Peoria Chorus when I was a member in 1984 and 85. Uh, and um, so, you know, I'm, I'm like two degrees removed from Meredith Wilson on, the, on that score. Uh, but they advised him to look for the uh, 1951 International Quartet Champions, the Buffalo Bills, who you see uh, in the movie. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's a central Illinois connection uh, to, uh, to the music man uh, that, uh, that's not well known. It's definitely Americana. I really, uh, really enjoyed it. It's really good. <laughs> Um, before I forget, I want to mention the websites, uh, PIDradio.com and VFTB.net. Uh, also, DerekPGilbert.com. Now, Derek, is there any other websites that you have? Well, of course, there's SharonKGilbert.com. Oh, that's why I missed that one. Oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You'll, if you find one, you'll find them all. Yeah, okay. they're all linked together. 
Now, also now, Derek's also had The God Conspiracy and Iron Dragons, and plus some other books. And Sharon's had Winds of Evil and Armageddon Strain. You can find those at PID, the PID store. Well, thank you for mentioning those. You know, well, you're we, welcome. We honestly, honestly, we love to write. And if the books sell, we're happy about it. But, you know, it's the message. That's what really matters to us. Getting the books out there, that's sort of gravy on the side. Well, you know, that's exciting because it's always neat to find out you know, things because so often you hear about a radio show and have people on, but you know, when you find out about the books or even like we talked about the quartet, it's nice to find out things that are going on besides just a talk, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, we, we kind of joke about that because uh, I, I think to look at us, you know, people who'd see us uh, shopping at Walmart or at the local county market or wherever would never know the kind of things that we talk about you know, behind the walls of the bunker. <laughs> sure. Uh, that's why we kind of joke about it. You know, the bunker, yeah, it's the split level bunker at the end of the cul-de-sac. It's not like we're trying to hide anything. We're certainly not encouraging, uh, you know, people to disregard what's happening in the world out there. But by the same token, uh, we're not um, fearful of what's happening out there. We're, we're just trying to keep uh, a watchful eye on the things happening around us, try to look at the uh, developments in geopolitics and uh, spiritual developments through a scriptural lens um, w- with an understanding that ultimately, at the end of all things, God wins. And we know this. And if mm. you've already signed up for his team, uh, I like the way Patty Heron puts it. We're, yes, we're on the Titanic. It's going to hit this iceberg and sink. Yeah. You've got a guaranteed spot in the lifeboat. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're okay. It may not be a fun ride until we get that final rescue, but you're ultimately going to be okay. And that's the exciting part, knowing him, because, boy, I tell you what, when all else fails, you can always pull on to him and always know he's going to pull you through. Amen to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Derek, uh, now we're going to talk about the Prophecy Conference down in um, Colorado Springs here coming at the end of July of 2013. Um, but can I have both of you just share a little bit about yourself? I know, Derek, that you've actually done radio and some other things. Uh, maybe give a little a synopsis of yourself. Go ahead. Well... It all started back at a 500 watt <laughs> daytime radio station. No. Uh, I was born- in the living room of your parents' home. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, my dad is uh, uh, sadly no longer with us, but he mm. used to say that if you ask Derek the time, he'd tell you how to build a watch. Yeah. And he's probably right. There's a picture that uh, he saved of me trying to talk on the telephone at the age of about 18 months up at my grandparents' farm in North Dakota. Oh. Uh, that's sort of uh, the tone that was set for the rest of my uh, my life. A friend of mine and I would get together, you know, our mothers were best friends and we'd we'd play. And, you know, for us, great fun was to take a uh, cassette tape recorder and uh, record our own radio station. You know, this was at the age of eight or nine. Mm -hmm. Um, When my normal friends were listening to Top 40 Radio growing up in Chicago, um, I was listening to the late night talk show hosts. Oh, okay. And that was what I wanted to do when I grew up. So I got into college, managed to uh, get a spot on the college radio station. Uh, got hired. I, I think it was my first or second time on the air uh, at the campus radio station, the local radio station in Galesburg, Illinois. Um, operations manager called and said, well, it sounds like you can talk. How'd you like to apply for a job? Oh, well, if I can get paid to do this, yeah. <laughs> who needs law school? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so I went into the radio business while I was in college, kind of worked my way through college by putting in a lot of hours at the local station there and at a suburban Chicago radio station when I was home on vacation, uh, went into the business full time after college, um, did not do talk radio because nobody wants to hear a 22 year old talk show host cause you don't know anything, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, went into music radio, spent uh, eight years after college in that before I realized that it was a lousy way to try to raise a family. Um, moved frequently from Peoria to Philadelphia to Little Rock to St. Louis in the span of five years. Oh, wow. Uh, so got out of that in the early 90s, looked around for something else to do, wound up in uh, uh, steel sales, which is uh, what I'm doing to this day with uh, a brief midlife crisis period about seven years ago when I had to go back into radio, did do talk radio this time professionally, um, but it was just enough of a taste to remind me why I got out of radio in the first place. Yeah. Uh, Lord has blessed us with, um, I, I think, and I think Sharon would agree that her life track has been this very similar in that God took us down some paths that we wouldn't have expected uh, to pre- kind of prepare us for where we are right now. Um, the The radio experience has uh, given me just enough technical know-how to have set up a, uh, a, a very workable little s- studio here. 
and to put together a, a workable mobile studio that uh, the Prophecy in the News has been gracious enough to allow us to uh, take to their last two conferences. So uh, um, th- that's kind of it. I, I accepted, ma- made a profession of, mm. of at the age of about 11, uh, sixth grade time frame. So, uh, uh, but I didn't really know what that meant, I don't think, because I spent a lot of time through college and after college not living in a way that was in accord with Scripture. And it was not until my mid-30s that I started reading the Bible after a a major life change, Um, not necessarily for the right reasons, but the Holy Spirit used it to his ends and uh, led me down a path where I began to consider the evidence for the truth claims of Christianity, uh, apologetics, Mm -hmm. began to understand that that there's very, very strong evidence that the Bible that we hold in our hands today, the New Testament in particular, is over 99% free of error. Uh, so the words that were written down by the authors of the New Testament in the first century, uh, we, reading it in English today, are, are getting about 98-99% of what they wrote uh, in, in, you know, unaltered, mm-hmm. uh, translated to the best of the ability of the, uh, the translators under the guiding of the Holy Spirit. So uh, that was suddenly like a, a switch had been flipped once I realized that. Uh, it's like, oh, okay, if yeah. this is all true, then the fact that Jesus referred to the Old Testament as being literally true means all of that's true. And, oh, wow, do I have some changes to make in the way I live my life? Yeah. Um, and it, it was astounding. The, the only other thing I can compare that to, uh, the, just that, that sudden moment where everything clicked into place, mm-hmm. was the moment that I knew that Sharon was the woman I would love for the rest of my life. It was. Uh, there, there, it, it sounds cornball, and I was listening to you know I don't know where I heard this the other day. Listening to the radio and heard some cornball nineteen seventies <laughs> ballad. Oh, I know. I was listening to the old radio station I used to work for in Peoria, which at the time back in the eighties was top forty. Now it's all you know <laughs> cornball radio. It's, it's all cla- it's all classic <laughs> hits. And I think this was all the stuff we were playing when I was there, and they were current. I'm old enough to be a classic now, isn't that great? Wow. So anyway, it was some cornball, sappy early eighties ballad, Air Supply, maybe, and thinking, you know, I really thought this was stupid then. Now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what can happen when the Lord applies a board. <laughs> Look at Sam. Yeah. <laughs> what are you saying? You can almost see it over his hand. A little thought balloon as he's peeking out from underneath the binky. <laughs> Just his head sticking out. So anyway, so, this, so that's where I am today. Um, it, uh, uh, you know, my, my, my belief that uh, the Bible is true as written, that Jesus literally lived, died, performed miracles, rose again from the dead, um, that's just as solid as um, believing that my feet will hit the floor and not the ceiling when I get out of bed mm. in the morning. Um, and I don't credit myself for that. I, I just think the Holy Spirit and, and the Lord was just very, very patient with me through many years of uh, living in, in a way that did not honor him. Yeah, well, I, you know, I always like when people give a testimony because it, it attributes to other people out there that may not be or not sure that you never know where these broadcasts can go, but it can touch someone's life and totally wake them up to, because, you know, Derek, your testimony there may touch someone in a way that my testimony may not. It, well, that's what the Apostle Paul, uh, mm-hmm. I, the, the example he gave when he went to Mars Hill and, and talked to the people of Athens. Uh, you know, he was trying to reach them where they were, and there were other approaches that he used with other churches. The tones of his letters are, are not all the same. He didn't use a one-size-fits-all fit all mm-hmm. approach. Um, and then different apostles, different um, evangelists in, in the Bible didn't use the same approach either. I mean, the Apostle John is very gentle in the tone that he uses, even when he's rep- reproving and rebuking. Um, you know, it's it's really interesting. I was just thinking about Nicole when yeah. she first started reading Paul's letters. <laughs> he's sort of the Mr. Furious of the Bible, isn't he, Dad? Yeah, we... Uh, that was the letter to the Galatians. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. You foolish Galatians! Why? You... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's like Mr. Furious, isn't he? He's like, well, <laughs> he's trying to knock some sense of them. But, you know, Jesus even used that approach where he was very tolerant and loving to uh, mm-hmm. little children. But then there were times when he was just very uh, blunt with mm-hmm. the apostles. How long must I put up with this, this you know, uh, foolish generation? You know, don't, don't you get it yet? Mm-hmm. You blockheads. Uh, he didn't put it that way, of course, but uh, uh, the point being, that not, not one approach is going to fit everybody, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right, different uh, yeah. 
I mean, Sharon's, Sharon's testimony is very different from mine. She knew from very early on. It's yeah. radically different. I, I didn't grow up in Chicago, nowhere <laughs> close. Well, sort of. One state over. Yeah. Chicago being its own state. Opposite end of the state. It wasn't Gary, Indiana, yeah. Yeah. was it? No. 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 The music man, I'm thinking. Indiana. No, I grew up in Madison, Indiana, which okay. is on way the other end of the state on the Ohio River. A uh, beautiful, beautiful, picturesque sound. Can you, uh, can you turn me my ears up? I'm, I'm no, over, I can't. Over talking because oh, okay, that's right. That's, as loud, work as, that's as loud as it goes. Okay, well, I will. I'll do my best. Um, probably, I would say from the age of three or four that I, in my my earliest memories are uh, of talking to God and knowing, knowing in my heart of hearts that He was that helped. Knowing absolutely that He was there. And he could hear me, he loved me, and he only wanted the best for me. I, I knew that from such an early age. And I went up to my mom and dad and my aunt and uncle, uh, you know, just about every Sunday and said, can I go forward in church today? Because he's, he's going to give that invitation and I want to tell everybody that I love Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I was nine years old before they said yes. Mm. Nine years old, so probably five or six years of, can I go now? Can I go Sunday? Can I, can I, ha, 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 Are we there yet? <laughs> Are we there yet? Am I there yet? Uh, finally, at the age of nine, almost ten, uh, I got to go forward in um, uh, what was called, I don't know if uh, people listening to this are familiar with revivals. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church that uh, became an independent Baptist church later on. Uh, so we were having a revival one August, and I got to go forward and tell everybody that I love Jesus as my Savior and King. And I've made some good choices. Mm-hmm. I've made some stupid choices mm-hmm. <laughs> since yeah. that Sunday. Um, when I was in my teen years, I went off the rails for a while. I think many of us do when we are uh, confronted with notions that we think, well, mom and dad are too stupid to know this. <laughs> yeah. So I will learn this. And, uh, you know, I grew up in this, uh, I graduated in 1970. So the 1960s, you know, you got a lot of UFO books mm. and, and chariots of the gods and, and a lot of books that came out that really challenged my thinking as a believer. And I praise the Lord for walking next to me and carrying me on his shoulders many, many times, being so patient and loving. Um, I've, I've, at the time that you said you were listening to talk radio, I was reading Richard Matheson, who, by the way, mm-hmm. died today. Oh, no. Really? Richard Matheson Richard, passed oh, away. Oh, wow. Uh, fantastic science fiction yeah. writer. I pray that when he opened his eyes after passing the River Jordan, that he was not in torments. But, mm-hmm. you know, I have no idea where he stood with his relationship with Christ. Probably, you know, most science fiction writers tend not to be believers, sadly. Sure. Sure. But uh, you know, I loved science fiction in high school. I um, I loved opera in high school, and uh, I've spent most of my life, my adult life, singing in one sh- one way, shape, or form. Sang opera for a long time out in in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and studied music out there. But eventually, got my degree in molecular biology, which is why I write books that have uh, characters that are scientific and characters that are also uh, well singers. <laughs> well, you know, and it's funny. It's I had you need the first the first uh, the, uh, opera that uh, that combines uh, uh, <laughs> the first musical that combines opera and molecular biology. That would be really something. Yeah, yeah. There you go, the magic gene. <laughs> I, you know, I have one of your books, Sharon. Um, but when we moved to our house, I don't know where I, I don't know where I put it. So I'll, have to, I'll, have, I'll eventually I'll find it. Um, you know, Sharon, um, and I, I definitely, as we're talking, I want to touch on, you know, the different things that are going on with diseases. But um, you guys are going to be in Colorado Springs here in July of 2013 towards the end at uh, the Prophecy and News Conference. And what are some of the things that you're both going to share? Well, I've got a couple of uh, talks that I'm going to be given. One of is actually DNA 101. It, it, people who want to learn exactly, and, and I'm not going to get extremely specific. Sure. Although I did in Chicago, yeah. I got pretty darn specific. Rob, okay, this Rob is what Steve messenger is RNA it's... in. This is what transfer RNA is. <laughs> and now we're going to talk about string theory. <laughs> Rob Skiba's head exploded. <laughs> we're going to get into some of that stuff because I'll only have about 70 minutes at the most. Okay. I'll probably give people a break about an hour. But the other one is I'm going to get into what scientists are trying to do. Now that you understand DNA, let's talk about how science wants to change it and 
It's anything from inserting epigenetic uh, factors that will turn off certain genes or turn on certain genes uh, with the premise that we're going to make you better uh, to actually constructing their own dirt, so to speak. Uh, We're going to create synthetic genes from um, uh, bases that are made from scratch. Yeah, right. Get your own dirt, says God. (laughs) But... um, George Church and and uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil and and lots of the transhumanists out there they want to find a way to become God. I mean that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. And if science can figure out a way to do that and cut God out of it, they'll be so happy. Mm. It's not going to happen, but they they keep trying. So that's what we're going to talk about. And you're t- are you going to talk about Facebook again? Well, uh, not not Facebook so much, but uh, Google. Um, so it's it's going to be uh, focusing more on the uh, the the drive by the the uh, yeah, my microphone's sounding a little odd. I know right it's sounding so almost like. Yeah, are you is, turning into a Dalek? Let me turn this up just a little bit here. Is that it's a little bit uh, better? No, sounds good to That's me. Better, right? Tweaking. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, All right. sounds better. Uh, uh, yeah, it sounded like more more was coming out of your microphone than mine. Uh, the the uh, t- the the title, the working title anyway, is uh, "Googling the Apocalypse," and it's uh, dovetails dovetails with what uh, Sharon is, is uh, talking about. She's talking about the uh, the genetic components of it. Uh, my talk will be on the the artificial intelligence uh, aspect of it, but also how um, th- those in the transhumanist movement. Uh, th- that uh, some in the transhumanist movement are using certain thinkers uh, and influential uh, mystic uh, so-called Christians to give their beliefs and, and their their initiatives sort of a religious veneer it, to draw in um, uninformed Christians into their worldview. Essentially, what they're trying to do is is convince Christians that we need to substitute the Matrix for <laughs> the the New Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. I think I just found the subtitle for the uh, the talk. There you uh, go. Going, yeah, okay. Wow. Well, I'll take a note. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it, it, and it's weird. I was, in fact, I was talking with a friend about this uh, over the weekend. Uh, he, you know, was just kind of asking, "What what are you guys going to do when you, you're you're in Colorado Springs?" And so I started talking about it, and you know, his his eyes began to glaze, and, and that's uh, not. A, a criticism of uh, of this this friend of mine because it's sort of the response of the church as a whole. It, it sounds so science fiction that they believe it can't possibly be true. There can't really be people who are trying to create a a gigantic mainframe in which to upload all of our consciousnessnesses mm-hmm. so that we can become uh, the, these disembodied. Uh, electronic spirits, if you will, floating around in some sort of giant hard drive. That's what they believe. And when you start to really go down the trail blazed by Ray Kurzweil, Dr. Raymond Kurzweil, uh, and say, you know, his ultimate belief is that the cosmos itself will wake up Mm. and that the so-called dumb matter that makes up the earth and the moon and, you know, all of space, matter will itself become a substrate, a computing substrate in other words, the the universe will become sort of a giant hard drive in, mm-hmm. in which we will all live and create our own little, you know, ideas of heaven, I suppose. Um, but the frightening thing is that this is not all that different from the ideas proposed by a very influential uh, Jesuit priest who lived in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, a, a fellow who is more influential today, I think, than he was when he was alive, in, in part because the Vatican wouldn't publish a lot of his writings while he was alive. Yeah. And the, the transhumanists are using the writings of this, this Jesuit to give their ideas, uh, sort of a, to, to use those ideas as a bridge to Christians, to mm-hmm. liberal Christians. Um, and again, when you try to explain this to somebody at church, they're like, you know, this, this is just so weird. This can't possibly be true. And then yeah. you explain where the money is coming from that's financing this research. It's coming from companies like uh, Nokia, from Cisco, you know, big players mm-hmm. in the tech industry from um, Autodesk, the company that makes the big uh, you know, CAD software used by engineers, and, uh, oh, yeah, Google. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, guess who Google just hired as its director of engineering? Who's that? Dr. A. Kurzweil. Nice. So, okay. Yeah, so you, you, just, you fit that little piece into the puzzle, and suddenly people are going, oh, well, maybe there is something to this. And hopefully that, that is our goal is that, you know, hopefully we can wake up some of the folks – 
Do and the and I posters. think, I think, sorry, Sonny. No, go ahead. But I think this is one of the main reasons that we're seeing Europe and the United States begin brain projects. They, they want to map mm -hmm. the human brain. Yep. They want to understand how they, they, you know, many scientists see the human brain as nothing more than a big computer. And they want right. to figure out where all the connections lie. Mm -hmm. How do we figure out how to use this and, and make this uploadable to right. a, a right. massive Giant well, mainframe worldwide? Somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, this is kind of like that movie Lawnmower Man. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly what it's yes. like. Lawnmower Man, The Matrix. Mm -hmm. What was interesting about Lawnmower Man is if people haven't seen it, I mean, he was basically mentally, um, um, I would just say, I can't. He started out as very mentally challenged. That's right. He probably had an IQ of around 60, 70. Mm -hmm. And from at the end, it was probably more like 7,000. It was this huge difference. Mm -hmm. Very, very good movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of like uh, what they're trying to do now with Skynet, be everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, now, you know, with all these things that are, are happening, you know, we look at the Terminator and then Skynet and different things. How far off do you think we are before, let's say, like um, robots start patrolling? I don't understand that they're in Japan now, but when they actually, in our country, ourselves, start patrolling and doing different patrolling things. Now, they just fly. Yeah. Yeah. Drones. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't think it's that unreasonable. I mean, it's not doesn't require a whole lot of imagination to to conceive of a situation where um, you know, unmanned drones on autopilot essentially are, are uh, carrying out um, basic law enforcement duties. I mean, we've already got computers operating on their own volition, executing trades on Wall Street, which is why you sometimes get these crazy wild swings up mm -hmm. and down as uh, – you know, certain parameters are hit, and these trading computers will automatically start firing off trade after trade after trade. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, I, I, it's it's not that inconceivable to think that, uh, in the interest of uh, keeping the peace, while at mm -hmm. the same time uh, protecting the lives of uh, law enforcement uh, officers, keeping them safe, that we start using uh, robots to do things that uh, are normally handled by a live human being. We're doing it with soldiers now all the time, uh, although we're told that uh, the drones that we're flying are being piloted by a live person somewhere on the other side of the planet. But that won't last much longer. I right. mean, I've read, I was trying to find it while you were talking, DARPA has a, a call-out for a challenge for inventors to figure out a way to make, essentially make that drone sentient mm -hmm. yeah. so that it makes its own decisions on the fly because as a computer, yeah. strangely enough, if they see our brains as biocomputers, they, they still believe that drones can make that, that, that snap decision, okay, this is a real target, this is the person, kill them. Mm. Faster than a human would, plus the human might mm -hmm. just hesitate. Do I really want to take out that mom and the, and the little boy that are just 10 feet away? Yeah. The computer wouldn't mm -hmm. care. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm looking on Facebook right now. Peter Goodgame just put up, um, he had uh, just seen Texas, two zombie attacks. Sharon, what are your thoughts on what's going on with these zombie attacks in that? You know, I honestly don't really know for sure. I, I do believe that, I, I really am a believer <laughs> I've got your tinfoil hat. Sure. I really am a believer in uh, individuals who have knowingly or unknowingly uh, participated in projects that essentially seek to undermine the human will. Mm -hmm. they, they seek to take away free will by either implanting psychological triggers or literally implanting uh, chips in some way that will flip a switch in a person. And I think some of these could be, I'm not saying they are, but I think some of them could be tests. For instance, the, uh, uh, oh, the, it wasn't a zombie attack, but there was the attack in the UK. Why uh, did, the, did these uh, young men suddenly decide to take out this soldier? Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it may have been something far more than we could ever guess if we were just trying to look at it geopolitically. Uh, but there have to be tests over and over and over and again. Uh, if you have someone who has been psychologically triggered, then you need to find out, Manchurian candidate kind of thing, you need to find out how far you can make that person go. Mm -hmm. What can I give, force this person to do? Yeah. On the other hand, some of these things I sim simply think are results of 
drugs that have become street ready and street cheap. Um, the the spice uh, drugs that are out there, THC uh, derivatives that are out there, bath. THC being yeah, so called bath, bath salts. salts. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but spice is, I think, one of the names of the THC group. Mm, okay. These these are things that essentially make you a crazy person. Mm-hmm. I mean, really crazy person. But when, when uh, I haven't seen Peter's post, when he talks about zombies, is he talking about sort of like the guy down in Florida that was eating the face off this other gentleman and, and claimed later on he had no idea? Well, I guess they had they to kill the dead. guy. They, yeah, they he, shot him dead. He didn't, yeah, he didn't say anything. He, he said nothing. Yeah. Uh, this guy basically, it sounds like um, he went crazy running on all fourth and he stripped off his clothes. You know, some of the stuff that you've heard like in Florida. Well, think about all of the the uh, trials that take place on college campuses. Mm-hmm. And it's usually young men who volunteer for these things. They're paid and they don't necessarily know what they're being injected with. They may go, th- go through psychological trials. If you are in a psychological trial... How do you know at the end of it all what you were, how you were used? Mm, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you don't know what kind of Kool Aid you might be drinking. Well, do exactly. you remember the psychology experiment from years and years ago, many decades ago, where one uh, the the student was on one side of the glass and there was another student on the other side of the glass, and uh, the it was a supposedly a, a uh, psych not psy but p s y. Um, trying to see if someone was psychic. And he had to hold up the card. The student who was volunteering held up a card and said, okay, what one is this? Wavy line, star, you know, whatever it is. And if the person got it wrong on the other side of the glass, the student was to hit a buzzer and send an electric shock through the chair. It turned out that the actual subject of the experiment was the person hitting the button to send the electric shock through the chair. They were trying to determine how far you could push a subject to hurt someone else just uh-huh. by telling them that's mm-hmm. what you're supposed to do. Yeah, and, and because the guy uh, giving the instructions is wearing a white lab coat, uh, presumably the subject said, well, he knows what he's doing and I'm not responsible because he's the one who's doing the experiment and I'm just following orders. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. In fact, do you know orders. that there's a, a, a literal condition called um, white coat hypertension? Oh, really? Yeah, it's it's a condition where you, when you walk into a doctor's office or a hospital, you automatically get your your blood pressure automatically ele- elevates. So oh, you sit down in the chair and they take your your blood pressure, and if it's high, oftentimes the person, you know, the the tech or the nurse will say, "I'll come back in a little bit and I'll check it again." Well, that explains why like when it, if you have white coat, coat have hypertension. Well, that explains why I don't have to clip my fingernails after I leave the doctor's office. <laughs> that's the fourth chair we've had to replace after mr myers yeah. added to his bill <laughs> um you know um that all being said you know is the church ready for all this coming down no uh-uh. yeah yeah no, we're not uh-uh. yeah how, how do we, okay so if they're not ready how do we convey it to them that are let's say sleeping still hmm I mean, I know that's a tough question, but... Well, you can't just start from where you and I are discussing. The sure. three of us, we, we've we been, you know, investigating these topics for a while. Um, when you and I first met, Derek, we talked about some of these things, and, mm-hmm. and I sort of got that, you know, deer-in-the-headlights look from you there very mm-hmm. early yeah, on. That's true. Because I'm not sure you thought I was sane. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I had not had uh, She's a little crazy. the opportunity to follow, but I had had some, you know, early exposure to conspiracy theory. Dad was, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a an intelligent guy who liked to read and uh, had considered the alternate explanations for the the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was uh, he had uh, Eric von Daniken's books. He ultimately decided, um, and we had a chance to talk about this the, in the weeks before he passed away. How. Uh, uh, you know, he he looked into all of that stuff. You know, that uh, the ancient astronaut theory, mm-hmm. the theories that uh, Jesus hadn't really died on the cross, but had been rescued before he died, or he had died, but this but the disciples stole the body, or uh, that he never really existed. And he finally concluded that it took a lot more faith to believe in any any of those. That those were the bigger conspiracy theories than believing that Christianity was actually true. That the New Testament was accurate. Um, but you know, I did read in, you know some of those things, and so I always had sort of a curiosity to. Uh, toward UFOs and the unexplained. 
uh, and actually read um, Holy Blood, Holy Grail years oh, ago. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Before we met. Uh, or at least I tried to. I got partway into it. And I just, like, these guys aren't connecting dots here. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're putting a dot here and a dot here, and it's just leaping from one to the other. There's no there there. But uh, so it did take me a little while to catch up. But um, once you start looking into history, you realize that history is not a series of coincidences, yeah. uh, that history really conforms better to a conspiracy theory than a coincidence theory. So uh, I, I think we have to try to take a lesson from Paul and find out where people are. And, you know, maybe as in the, the case of the fellow that I talked to this weekend and, mm-hmm. and say, so, you know, when you just point out, say, like, well, here is what these people believe. Oh, that's crazy talk. No yeah. one really thinks that. It's like, well, you know who the prime, there's a guy and here, his name is Dr. Ray Kurzweil and here's it. it, it oh, that's nuts. Nobody like, really. Did you know that he's just been hired by the most powerful technology company on planet Earth, the company that shapes the way you view the world by tailoring its search results, your search results, to what it thinks you want? Mm. Oh. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, that's like the first chink in the armor. Oh, well, another question. What do you think of the Human Genome Project? Oh, I think it was great. I think it's so good that we did that. You know the guy who headed it up here in the United States, George Church? Do you know what he wants to do? He wants to straw it all over. <laughs> He yeah, wants yeah. to start from synthetic DNA, and he wants to start all over because he says mankind is is we're we're corrupt and we're diseased and we're prone to this and that, and he wants to make nice, strong, new beings. <laughs> the master race. He yeah. calls it regenesis. Uh huh. The local radio station here in town. Um, we get a chance to call in, so I'll call in and vice versa. But there's one guy from Nebraska. And it's paranoid, delusional. Anyway, his short name is Skits. And so he's always calling in about something and, you know, about kind of like maybe some stuff like this or other things that pertain to what's kind of going on. And people calling, oh, you know, that's just hearsay or that's just talking. And I'm like going, well, let's see here. You know, you've heard about the smart meters and different things. And people just kind of like they want to go shopping and do their job and everything else. Don't tell me about it. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking to a member of my family years ago and saying, uh, this was in the the late 80s, and saying, you do realize, we were talking about geopolitics, and I said, you do realize that prophecy is coming together. I mean, take a look at Europe. They're getting ready to join and be one big nation. And he said, that's never going to happen. And about five (laughs) years later, it was announced, of course. And I'd been reading for, you know, a couple of decades that the EU, the common market, was going to become its own, you know, essentially Europa. And he just laughed and he said, ah, oh, that's never going to happen. Yeah, what crazy talk. You know, one of the things that I'm really kind of always have been since a kid is Bigfoot. I've always thought it was very interesting. And, of course, you know, you, you always like to listen to things. Have you guys ever come across anybody that have told you about what they've seen or heard? No one actually in person. Okay. Well, I just- I've talked to a couple, not not in in terms of cryptids like Bigfoot, but sure, you know, other you know paranormal experiences. But uh, uh, have you ever seen one? No, you know I have never have, but I actually heard some weird things, and I'll kind of just set it up real quick. We're all camping about oh 150 miles west of where I'm at in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and and uh, we have the Burmese Mountain Dog with us, and it was about seven o'clock on a Sunday morning, and we heard something like a banshee yell about a mile away, and I'm like. Oh, my gosh, I'm trying to get up my recorder, and, of course, the batteries are dead. And, and about 12, 10 minutes later, my wife went down to the creek, and the dog would not go down, would not go down by the creek. Anyways, I had walked over to the fire pit, and um, I heard something about a block in, uh, taking rocks and going click, 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 click. And there's nobody about a mile from us. We had been ATV, and so there's nobody around us. And so I picked up some smooth rocks and did the same thing, no response. But, boy, she was just, the dog was really going berserk. Um, that's just my, um, I don't know, throw my hat in the ring type thing. You know, always pay attention to your dog. Yeah. 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 That, uh, Sam has made it very clear that we, we need to pay attention, especially when it's, you know, we're, we're close to finishing up what's on our plate. Mm-hmm. Sure. He, 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 you're done. You're done now. Well, you know, we, with <laughs> one of the other. And I'll bun- finish that for you. Former bunker dog. Sam says, don't even talk about that. Dog named Murphy back in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. One time we were in the living room and he suddenly jumped on the back of the couch and started barking at the ceiling. Mm -hmm. There was nothing up there that we could see, but he was going on and Mm -hmm. on and on about something that I think he saw. Well, I tell you what, when our dog barks, the big Burmese-bound dog, in the middle of the night, you're up now. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, no, definitely, um, they de- definitely do tell you what's going on. It's nice having dogs around because they're a company, and but they do tell you what's going on. Amen to that. Amen, brother. Well, I don't know. I've I've heard some strange sounds in the middle of the night too. Out in the country, you'll hear howls that they don't sound right. They mm-hmm. don't sound natural. Yeah. Uh, there's some. Well, what about that Plum Island? They're moving to Kansas. Oh, Banff, not Banff. Uh, um, um, oh gosh, Enbeth. Enbeth. Yeah, yeah. National, uh, oh, bio and agro uh, defense facility. Is that? Uh, yeah, something like something that. Like I'll, that. I'll, I'll look gosh, it up. It's, it's been a while since I've uh, been a while since I've talked about that. We we actually. You, I think you helped to, to keep that from being. Uh, Accepted in Colombia. Well, you talked against that daily. Don't I don't know about that. Uh, I, I, it was kind of interesting because we had a, an ongoing. Uh, there was a dispute. Actually, our morning show host thought it would be a great thing. Uh-huh. And he was talking it up while in the afternoon I was talking it down. Um, but had an, a, a, a a woman who'd done some research on it and had written a novel. Uh, her her uh, pen name uh, was uh, Kate Iola. Uh, her, her real name is Katie Thompson. Uh, but the the novel, if you, if you want to look it up, is a, is a good read, and it's it's really frightening. It's called Dead Stock, obviously, Dead stock. or lives, Livestock. The point of the novel was to demonstrate how easy it would be for terrorists to darn near cripple the American economy uh, without having to resort to any of the, the things that we are constantly warned about, you know, like Condoleezza Rice, mushroom cloud over an American city, you know, the things that they, they try to frighten us with to justify naked airport scanners, which, by mm-hmm. the way, are taken out now, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah, and, you know, having the NSA listen to all of our phone calls and read all our email. And uh, d- did you know that the post office, um, at least in certain parts of the country, takes a photograph of the front and back of every piece of mail that goes through its, its scanners? Really? And what do they do with that? Well, I'm just store yeah. it somewhere. I mean, they've got to do s- something. Part of- Prism? It, it, yeah. Well, uh, I, I think Prism just relates to the uh, splitting of the fiber optic cables and uh, you know the, the light that goes through there. It's uh, a, the country tap that the NSA has Im- imposed on us. But um, where was I going with this? Oh, that uh, instead of having to worry about a, a dirty nuke or um, something like that showing up in American City, what we really ought to worry about is a terrorist bringing some infected manure, manure infected with uh, hoof and mouth. Well, in fact, I was just telling you before we came on uh, this wonderful show, I was talking about the new piglet disease that has struck in North America. We've never had that disease here before, and it's already hit, what did I say? 200 farms. 200 farms. Right. Uh, Hoof and mouth. um, Yeah. Dis- distributed in, in the form of infected manure in, in, the, in uh, a, cer- a certain number of feedlots in the Midwest because of the prevailing wind patterns. I mean, if you've ever driven across the Midwest and see how many wind turbines there are mm-hmm. out here these days, you know, I, I like as a joke, and, and the fellows that uh, I call on uh, in my, my weekly rounds down in southern Illinois, where there's an awful lot of oil and gas exploration. You know, as a kid in Chicago, I had no idea, but you grow up in Chicago and you think the world ends at the Cook County line. <laughs> The, the the separation point between southern Illinois and central Illinois is when you stop seeing pump jacks, those uh, oh, yeah. out in the fields, and you start seeing these big wind turbines out there. But they put those wind turbines in position uh, to take advantage of prevailing winds. You get this manure into some of the feedlots in Kansas and Iowa and central Illinois where the wind's always a-blowing, mm-hmm. and it can spread in a hurry. And then you've got these deer that uh, are that travel from farm to farm looking for food and can pick it up, transmit it, carry it to other places. Before you know it, uh, and she paints a really scary picture of this in her novel, Deadstock, uh, you, you could have funeral pyres of thousands, if not millions, of, uh, of dead and burning uh, uh, carcasses of, of hogs and, and, and uh, cattle. And it, it's just it's a frightening thing. The American economy is in large part driven by its agricultural industry. Yeah. And, uh, if that's crippled, if foreign uh, markets dry up and refuse to accept American beef, American pork, um, you, you, American farmers would, would be um, – would be uh, would have no no place to sell their their wares. They would be uh, hurt, and then all of the industries that uh, and again I'm just learning this in the last sure. couple of years because many of the 
The folks that use the product my company sells are companies that make equipment and implements for the agriculture industry, some of our biggest users. Oh. So, uh, you know, suddenly the, the, guy, the companies like a Caterpillar and Komatsu and John Deere and Case New Holland have no, no, no market for their goods. Those company and the, th- the companies and the thousands upon thousands of people they employ are suddenly crippled. People are late. It, it would strike a devastating blow to the American economy and all a terrorist would have to do is smuggle a few hundred pounds of infected poop into hmm. the country. Simple way of doing it. Relatively simple way of doing it. And this was the whole argument against NBAF, the National Bio and Agro uh, Terror Defense. Defen- Bio and Agro Defense Facility. Uh, it was put on Plum Island, which is off the coast of New York City, off the coast of uh, Long Island, uh, where the prevailing winds blow out to sea. It's several miles off of Long Island. There's a reason they put it there, so that if anything. And that was the only facility in the United States where research was conducted on hoof and mouth. Uh, it's highly contagious. It hasn't been recorded in the United States in close to 100 years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and if it ever escaped Plum Island, and there were a couple of recorded accidents mm-hmm. in the history of that facility, the prevailing winds would blow the infection, the contagion, out to sea where there's no livestock. And even if it did blow inland, You've got New York City on the receiving end, and there's not much livestock in New York City. So the odds of it spreading to America's, the heart of America's agriculture industry um, was very small. Where did they decide to put it? Manhattan, Kansas. Exactly. Oh, there's a, you know, just a couple cows and pigs around Manhattan, Kansas. If it should happen to get out of that facility, the ag industry in Kansas and Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Dakotas, yeah, you know, uh, I wonder why Manhattan. I mean, that's downtown New York. The name. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm. I'm. I don't. Know. Is that is that a coincidence? That's a big question. Um, the one thing I will tell you is, just now broke ground on it, so it's going to be a while. Yeah. It's been four and a half years since uh, Manhattan, Kansas received the uh, award, but yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And there were people in Columbia, Missouri, the University of Missouri, that that were really, really pushing for it. Um, but the facility was going to be very close to an equine center, yep. very close to some schools, extremely way too close to lots and lots of farms. Oh, yeah. It, it was a f- foolish desire, and they just were looking at the dollar mm-hmm. signs. But they didn't realize the downside could have killed them, mm-hmm. literally yeah, could have yeah. killed them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it is a, a foolish thing, and I, I – hope that that cooler heads will prevail i i don't understand why no well i do understand why uh frankly plum island is not a very appealing place to to work yeah a lot of the scientists who have to work there have to take a ferry every day from connecticut or new york and it's not very convenient and when the weather's bad it's not very comfortable necessarily um a lot nicer to live in you know pastoral Rural Kansas and have a nice, pleasant track, or you know, central Missouri. I mean, the area around Columbia, Missouri, is very beautiful, uh, wonderful place to live. Drive into your new state-of-the-art facility there in America's heartland, and go home to a nice, comfortable home instead of having to go home. You know, a two or three-hour commute involving a long ride on a ferry through sometimes rough waters. You know, but again, there's a reason that Plum Island was the center for this. Uh, this kind of research, and they're moving it right into the heart, the heart of America's yeah. agri-industry. Well, that's assuming it ever gets there. If it's it a ever gets bad, there. bad idea. Yep. One article from April 26th of this year, uh, apparently Governor Sam Brownback of Kansas was telling lawmakers there that if they didn't approve additional funds for the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, NBEF, there's a chance it wouldn't get built. <laughs> mm. Oh, wouldn't that be awful? Yeah. yeah. $714 million is what the... Uh, Obama budget called for for 2014 mm. to help build that lab in Manhattan, Kansas. Manhattan, Kansas is close to Fort Riley, is it not? Oh, well, that's an interesting point because Fort Riley is uh, well known where for... the Spanish flu started. That's right. By some accounts, that's where the uh, the point of origin for the Spanish flu mm-hmm. in 1918. Patient zero supposedly was there, yeah. and I do say supposedly because there are some reports that show that China and India actually had it a couple of years before that. You know and. To- well, you know, and that's really interesting. You know, when it talking about animals, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Um, you know, we're not too far from Denver ourselves, but when you fly in the DIA, that big blue horse that greets you right there. <laughs> oh, Lucifer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well named. Yeah. The eyes follow you when you drive. You know, like if you miss your turn off, go around again. There he is following you. The eyes are following you every time. Oh, you know what? I think somebody's actually going, are we going to take a shuttle or 
someone picking us up there. We're flying into Denver. Oh, we are. Yes, we are. Oh, gosh, I hadn't even thought about that. Oh, (laughs) yes. yes. Oh, gosh. You made your night. I hadn't even thought about that. Yes. Oh, we get to fly into Denver. And fly (laughs) out of Denver. (laughs) We're going hours early so we can walk around and take all kinds of pictures. Oh, Oh, nice. Well, I'm glad I mentioned it to you then. Thank you. Sure. Well, we've never seen those in person. We've seen all right. of the pictures, yeah. but never seen them in person. You know, and it really does make a difference to actually see it and, t- and touch it and know that it's real. Because when you see it on the Internet, the assumption is, well, this is real. Yeah. Look, there's a picture of it. You're talking mm-hmm. about it. But how do we know? Well, it's like Snowden. How do we know? Yeah. And you know Snow what? Job. I mean. And one of the things that up here in Cheyenne Women, they have a super massive supercomputer. They, they just got online here a few months ago. Hmm. Pretty good size one. It's out um, oh west of us here, just a few miles, but uh, it's got a is, huge nitrogen that, tank on there. Is that the big storage facility for? No, that's Bluffdale, Utah. That's, where, oh, oh, that's yeah, right. Bluffdale, okay. Utah. Uh, the, the, is this uh, an experiment in quantum computing, or is this? Uh, I think so. I think so. Okay, this is getting into where you know. We, it's getting into entangled Ray pairs. Oh, no, yeah, it entangled is entangled pairs and, and so forth. Uh, yeah, super yeah. string. Uh, silly string. <laughs> I just figured it was interesting. It seemed like string theory. you hear so much in um, Denver. There's so much with Denver you hear. People and different project, projects. And now Cheyenne has that up here. I don't know. What's going on in the Intermountain West? I don't know. Well, Dick Cheney? Yeah. <laughs> Sharon, it, it, we, we talked a little bit about this on PID Radio over the weekend because uh, a Kansas entrepreneur is attempting to sell space in an underground cavern. It, it was a limestone quarry. Uh, so you've got these big hollowed out spaces with these um, uh, pillars left behind to support the roof. Uh, it's uh, essentially climate controlled inside. And he's wanting to sell reservations to people who want to preserve a spot for themselves deep underground for when things really hit the fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I've actually seen a facility like that in Columbia, Missouri. There was a limestone. Missouri is full of limestone, um, caves all over the place. Uh, you can't drive across the Midwest without seeing the big signs for Merrimack Caverns. Um, mm-hmm. Near Columbia, there's a facility similar to the one in Kansas that this guy's trying to sell. It's uh, huge. I mean, the, the ceilings are, are you know, 40, 50 feet tall. Uh, it's, it's relatively cool in there. It's um, fairly dry. And you can drive trucks right into the, the facility, which was the whole point, when you've got a quarry in there, you need to get you know, large quantities of the, the limestone back out. Mm-hmm. Um, this guy was trying to offer it as a place for companies that needed long-term storage for uh, medical records, for example. Uh, you needed some place to store uh, um, uh, you know, goods or items or whatever that needed a relatively uh, safe, secure, and climate-controlled environment. It seemed like a, a pretty good business model, but this guy... In Kansas is is, uh, is uh, turning taking that to an extreme and offering it as um, sort of like an underground ark to wait out the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. And Sharon pointed out that this is uh, uh, you know maybe what was uh, at least in part intended by the uh, the prophecy that uh, you know the uh, the great men of the earth would would basically hide themselves. Uh, under under your rocks and, and ask the rocks, and to, ask fall the rocks to fall on them to save them from the wrath of uh, of, of God and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know when when, when that time comes uh, it, again as Patty Heron says make sure you got your ticket for the lifeboat to get off the Titanic make sure that you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ uh, Christ in Him crucified that is your ticket out not hiding in a limestone cavern a uh, hundred feet below the earth not hiding in a continuity of government. Uh, uh, you know, uh, facility somewhere under Mount Weather, West Virginia. That's mm-hmm. not going to save you from the wrath of God. Uh, only the righteousness imputed to you by his sacrifice on the cross. That's mm-hmm. it. That's your only way out. Yeah, I, lo- I love that. You always do that because, you know, or those who we have on as guests, because we definitely want to get the gospel message out to people. Knowing Jesus Christ, your own Savior, is going to be your lifeboat out of here. Absolutely. And, and I hope that we always come back to that in, in, in what we talk about. You know, we, Sharon and I, uh, she's the most interesting person I know. Um, and the only one in this world who gets me. Aww. So when we start talking <laughs> like this, you know, I'd start talking like this with family members and they, you know, so oh, that's just Derek going off again. Yeah. Uh, telling Let's us just how to leave the two of them alone the so wash. they can talk to each other. Yeah. We'll go over here and, you know, watch Honey Boo Boo. Yeah. 
and, and we can, and I know I can get caught up in the sound of my own voice sometimes, and you know, impress myself with the the uh, you know my lofty thoughts, which are as nothing compared to him. Um, and the the the, the danger I, I find myself running into is focusing so much on that that I forget that our most potent weapon in the spiritual war is hitting our knees and praying. You know, it's not, you know, how can I be clever? How can I identify and analyze what's really going on behind the scenes here? Look, the enemies at work here, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood opponents. It's powers, principalities, thrones, dominions, whatever you want to call them, the ranks of angels identified by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. They're a lot smarter than I am, Mm -hmm. a lot older. They know Scripture a lot better than I do. So, you know, I I don't have a chance if I try to stand on my own uh, intelligence, my own create, you know, cleverness. Uh, I'm not that clever. Um, And so when we talk about these things, I hope the message we convey to folks is not... Mm -hmm. Uh, your, your salvation is to be found in knowing what your neighbors don't know about the real workings of the world, mm-hmm. what the secret societies are. All. No, that's not what's going to save you. No. It's Christ and him crucified. And if we don't bring it back to that every time, we're not doing our job. Amen, brother. Yeah, we only got a few minutes left. I don't want to take all your time up. Um, can I have you mention anything about your website, books, anything that you'd like to mention? You know, I said it before, we're really not, we, we're not in this to sell books. Sure. It's kind of you to mention the books. You, if you want to go to the websites, the one I'd mainly mention is PIDradio.com because that one will get you to everything else that mm-hmm. we do. I occasionally will write articles about science. <laughs> Sometimes I just write, you know, articles about whatever comes to my head that day. But Derek often will comment on things that are in the news. Uh, he and I try to stay uh, on top of what's going on because we feel that we have been called to be watchmen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, th- We are standing trying to see what is going on in the enemy camp and reporting back to those within the Savior's camp and, and saying, mm-hmm. you need to beware of this because they're after your children. Yeah, And your children know what's going on, but you don't. And th- there are those who are in the pews on, on Sunday mornings who um, you know, are, are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have no doubt of that. Mm-hmm. But who are unprepared to uh, uh, answer questions from their children or from the family members. What do you think about this guy here who says that, uh, you know, when you die, you can just kind of, you know, save your consciousness to a hard drive. You can save your mind and upload it and you can live forever. Mm-hmm. Oh, well... Yeah, uh, or this ma- ma- uh, magician, <laughs> the, this magician uh, named, I think he calls himself Dynamo in the United Kingdom, who levitates and walks on water. Yeah, maybe Jesus was just a real clever magician. Do you ever think about that? But, uh, hmm. Or, yeah. uh, you know, ghosts. I mean, there, there's such a, you know, the, the, the fad seems to have faded a little bit, or maybe just because we don't have cable anymore, we don't watch it or see the ads as often as we used to. But uh, there, there certainly has been a fascination with ghost hunter shows over the last few years. Um, how do we address those questions and, and you know, answer those questions from our friends and family members? Um, I know people who firmly believe themselves to be Christians mm-hmm. who also firmly believe that there are ghosts and that those ghosts are indeed the dear departed relatives that uh, we will see again someday because we all wind up in a better place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Now, I know that you guys find a lot of things that are interesting on Netflix. Have you been watching anything recently that was kind of maybe... Got you know, I just, me? I'm glad you asked because I just finished re-watching a series that may just not, it may float under the radar of most people who watch, you know, supernatural shows. It's called Apparitions and it's about a Catholic priest. Mm. You know, I, I'm not saying don't watch it because you, you don't, you're not a Catholic, but I did watch it. I'm not a Catholic, and I got just as much out of it. I think that they've really hit on what the supernatural realm oh, is yeah. trying to do. Yeah. The plot to bring the Antichrist out to, if you watch the whole plot, I don't know if you've seen Apparitions or not, no. but it, oh gosh, it is so Check good. <laughs> One of my favorite actors on there. Martin Shaw. Martin Shaw, he's amazing. Uh, he plays the priest, but they're the, the you know, the supporting cast also wonderful the guy who plays the uh, the italian cardinal oh my gosh he's, mm-hmm. i'm sorry the british cardinal in italy the plot is that those demons who have been consigned to hell uh want out and they believe that they if their messiah can be born that they will be redeemed 
Mm. And your Messiah, of course, is the Antichrist. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting take. Um, yeah. Sharon and Derek, thank you very much for coming on. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for asking us. It was a, it was a lot of fun. We, we enjoy having these kind of conversations. <laughs>